It's also important that when you cast that vision, it's not being cast from a space of escapism or romanticism, because then you have relief, which is great. But really, when you think about it, when you move from escapism and romanticism, it's just about anywhere being better than here. And that's not necessarily conducive for longevity or sustainability or cultivating a life well lived. Cultivating a life well lived requires you to be more particular, for you to be more nuanced, for you to be more curious about who you really are now and who you aspire to be. The, the things that you actually maybe have been denying yourself. And I think for a lot of black women, we have denied ourselves, right? That was impossible. That's not possible. We, you know, don't ask for too much. Like, that's good enough. We make do. We're very resourceful. You know, black women of color, we're like, okay, you know, we, we make it. Uh, I'm going to work with it. I'm going to work with it and I'm going to excel. I'm going to work with it. But this is a time to really think about what would it be like if I lived a life in which I didn't have to make do? What would it be like? If I lived a life of ease, what does ease even mean in my life? Welcome to Flourish in the Foreign, an award-winning podcast that celebrates, elevates, and affirms the voices and stories of Black women living and thriving abroad while exploring living abroad as a pathway to wellness. I'm your host, Christine Job a Black American woman with Trinidadian roots, podcaster, business strategist, and entrepreneur based in Valencia, Spain. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Flourish in the Foreign. I'm your host, Christine Job. I'm popping into the feed with a new episode. But before the episode, I want to let you know that if you have been a Patreon subscriber to Flourish in the Foreign, that I am going to be discontinuing the Patreon by the end of this year. And so please join us on Buy Me a Coffee. Now, Buy Me a Coffee has really great features because you can just do one time donations and support or you can now become members of my Buy Me a Coffee community membership. It's an easy way for you to support this podcast, just like y'all support Hulu and Netflix and all them. You can support this here black solo indie podcaster monthly. First tier at $5 a month, the next tier at $10 a month, and the third tier at $20 a month. Now, everyone who becomes a member... And as a member for at least three months, it's going to get a handwritten thank you note from me. And actually, some of you guys who have purchased products or done some courses with me know that I like to do that sometimes. I really like sending out hand, no, handwritten notes. I don't know. It's a Southern girl in me. I'm going to drop like the news for anything that's upcoming. Y'all going to know first. Now I am bringing back the Flourish Some Form book club. I am. I am. And we're going to be doing our author chats again. Okay. We are going to do it. Now, let me tell you right now, the books that we'll be kicking off our chats with, one of them you can get right now and you can join me in September for the author chat. The other one you cannot, but you can come and hang out. So the first book is going to be Beyond the Shore, A History of African Americans Abroad by Tamara J. Walker. I will be speaking with Miss Walker in September. So if you're a member of the Flourish in the Forum Buy Me a Coffee membership, you'll get an invitation to join the conversation. Yeah. So basically, I'll have the interview with Tamara. Then at the end, I'm going to open up for a Q&A. Even if at the moment you're not able to support the podcast by becoming a member, this interview will go live on the podcast feed. It's just that it'll go live later. It'll be edited and it won't have the Q&A and you won't get any of your questions answered. That's it. Now, I am doing another author chat with Miss Lola Akamande. You know her because she's been a guest on this podcast. I did another author chat with her for her first fiction book, In Every Marriage She's Black. She has another book coming out, 
Everything is Not Enough. And we'll be doing an interview and author chat in September. Now, that book won't be released till October. I have an advanced review copy, so I'm reading the book and it's good. So I am thinking about opening up that opportunity for you guys to to chat with Lola, but there'll be a lot of spoilers. So if you don't want to know, then maybe you don't want to come. But those are the kinds of things going to be available in the membership. And I already have some more books. I'm starting to line up interviews for the rest of this year because that's like my happy place. I really like reading these books and I really love talking to these authors and bring them to you. Okay. So that's for all of the tiers. Now, the second tier is everything I just mentioned, plus a monthly coffee chat with me where I'm going to pick a topic about black mobility, geopolitics, something in the news, and we're going to chat about it. And you can ask me questions about it, but like, that's what we're going to do when I going to have like a very chill conversation about migration, living abroad, living a life well lived, all of those things. Now, the third tier has everything I just mentioned, plus exclusive access to behind the scenes of the podcast. Now, some of you guys are podcasters or aspiring podcasters, and you're like, how do you do what you do? This is where I will show you how I do the things I do and give you access to some of the things I even have coming up, which is beyond podcasting. Like, how do I create a podcast and get people to listen to it and to be engaged? I also let you guys sit in on some of the interviews that I do with guests, which I think might be really fun for y'all and see the process. So those are the tiers. If you're like, that would be cool, but something else, you can also always give me a suggestion. But this is how you support Flourish in the Foreign, not only in the vision of celebrating and elevating Black women voices and stories who are living and thriving abroad, but this is how you make this podcast sustainable and have longevity. We've been out here for over three years, over 100 episodes, and it's all about community. So if you believe and flourish in the foreign, you love it and you support it, this is how we do that, right? This is how I'm able to bring you these amazing stories. So go ahead and support Flourish in the Foreign and join me. Because I can't wait to write y'all my thank you notes. I've already been looking at stationery. Go to buymeacoffee.com slash flourish foreign. There's going to be a tab at the top where it says memberships. Click on that and you can pick your tier. You can join me. Yay. All right. On to the next episode. Episode. Today's episode is a throwback Instagram live all about living in Spain. Yes, it's a question I get a lot. And so I did an IG live back in 2022, but I still get asked about it a lot. So definitely check it out. You can go on Instagram, make sure you're following the podcast at Flourish the Foreign on Instagram. I actually uploaded it to YouTube as well. So go to Flourish in the Foreign on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and have the notifications put on. But you can watch it there as well. In this discussion, I chat about my personal experience living in northern Spain in La Rioja, then living in Barcelona, and then living in Valencia, where I currently reside. So if you're interested about learning about Spain and you're curious, this is the episode for you. Now, depending on when you're listening to this, a lot of things could change. So please keep that in mind. Also, just recognize that this is my personal opinion. Okay. So yeah. All right. Without further ado, here is me talking about living in Spain. Hey everyone, it's me, Christine. Today I'm going to be talking about my experience as a Black American woman here in Spain. I've lived in three different cities, Logroño in northern Spain, Barcelona, and Valencia. I'm going to tell you about my experiences, why I decided to move, and why it's important to consider who you are, what you need, and allow yourself to be flexible as you move abroad. And allow yourself to change your mind. It's all about being true to yourself. So 
that's what you should do. So if you have listened to the podcast, if you have watched some of my other lives, you kind of know about my journey to living in Spain. Today, what I want to talk about is the pathway to wellness in deciding on a city, but also changing your mind. A lot of people put so much pressure on themselves and they're like, I have to move abroad and it's going to be like one and done. And it may not be that way. I lived in three cities so far. I might move to a different country. Who knows, right? So let's start from the very beginning. I moved to Spain in 2017 and I moved to Logroño, La Rioja. Logroño is the capital of La Rioja and La Rioja is the smallest comunidad or state in Spain. And I moved there to be an auxiliar de conversación, which is a language teacher. And I did that for a sabbatical for about nine months. I chose that re region. And actually back then, not a lot of people were choosing La Rioja because everybody wants to be in Madrid. Everybody wants to be in Barcelona or Catalonia or even Valencia. And I chose it because a couple of years before that, I had walked the Camino de Santiago, which is a pilgrimage throughout Spain. There's many different routes. I walked the most popular route, which is the Camino Frances, which is up and over the French Pyrenees and onto the Spanish Pyrenees and across Spain until you get to the Atlantic coast. And one of the towns, one of the cities that is on the Camino is Logroño. And I had a really good experience in Logroño, actually. It's such a cute, I guess it's a city, it, but it's kind of like a town, okay? <laughs> It's a capital of the smallest community. So it is quite small. And because the region is obviously known for wine and other agriculture, it kind of has like a sleepy, low, like low key kind of vibe to it. So when I moved there, I was really cool. Like some people might have been like, no, I want Madrid. I was actually very happy to be there. My experience, which I talked about actually being a teacher in Spain in La Rioja. I actually talked in the previous live, so check that out. But let me be frank, it is a small, small city, town, and everybody knows everyone. And I'm from Atlanta, a big city, and I lived in Miami, another big city, and I just wasn't accustomed to, to I had students who'd be like, I saw you. And I'd be like, where did you see me? Like, what? They're like, oh, I saw you in the park. And I'm like, why you gotta say like say like that? Like I I wasn't accustomed to that. Not that I was out here doing anything, I don't know, untoward or just weird. I wasn't. But I just I don't really I'm not a person that likes people to know where how I move. <laughs> I don't really like people to be like, I see your movements and things like that. So I knew when I moved there, even though I had made friends really easily, that uh, pretty quickly I was like, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to stay here. I just wasn't sure. Now, I think what is also interesting about La Rioja is that nobody really speaks English. So it was excellent to land there and have to practice and to really assert my Spanish. The flip side to that is that, you know, I think everyone when you first move abroad goes through like the honeymoon, but also something that people don't talk nearly enough about is people experience severe homesickness and isolation. Don't let those IG stories fool you because there's a lot of frustration, especially if you move to some place that you don't speak the language. And so it's not only you cannot communicate well, but you also, it takes a hit to your self-esteem because you'll be like, I'm really smart but I can't communicate or like you're looking at me like I'm dumb because I'm asking you for something that would be in an American grocery store that is not in a Spanish grocery store. And they're looking at you like, girl, what's wrong with you? Like those types of things really affect, you know, your self-esteem. It definitely affected my self-esteem. You can kind of slide into isolation, get a little bit of social anxiety because you're like, dang, I need to go do this, but I got to hype myself up and say like, I'm gonna say this, and they're gonna say that, and I'm gonna say this, and they're gonna say that, and go do it, and they don't use any of the words that you had imagined in your brain that they were gonna say. Yeah, right? So that is definitely an issue, and uh, you know, it definitely contributed to me feeling a little bit out of place at first, but I jumped in, I jumped into it. I, 
I started going to the gym, having classes in Spanish. I went to Spanish class and did activities. So after that, it was fine. But I will say that, you know, there wasn't a lot of black people in Logroño. I mean, it is Spain, but there are Afro-Spanish, there's Afro-Pakistani, Moroccan, Chinese, people who are many, many generations here in Spain. People don't talk about it apparently, but it's true. But yeah, there wasn't a big black population, like a black community. There were other auxiliars who were black and that was cool because we got to kick it and that was awesome. But not a lot of other black people. I will say that there is, there was like, I, cause I taught at like the ethnic school and I didn't say that, that that's what people in the town told me. And I was like, they, no, they call it the immigrant school. And I was like, what does that mean? And that was the black and brown school. Spanish people, I think lack tact. That's a different conversation for another day. And so they obviously have moms and sisters and things like that, but that community felt very much apart. And I felt like, something that maybe you as a traveler have felt when you go to certain places. I give everybody the black person nod, you know, and I'm Southern, so I'm probably going to smile at you and be like, Hi. and people are like, that's crazy. Stop smiling at people or stop, you know, I'll be like catching their eye. Like, are they going to see? No. Okay. You know what I mean? So I'm used to that. And so that didn't happen. That bummed me out for sure. But it still has some black people. And there was a black hair care store actually in Logroño. I don't know if I bought anything actually because I had just started my lock journey and I think I had everything I needed. I think I just went to like, you know, peruse to see what's going on. So there's that. I I think that Lagroño, if you haven't been to Spain, you should definitely go to La Rioja. Wine, it'll ruin you. I'm telling you that right now. Cause you're gonna be like, I'm not paying these prices for this mediocre wine. It is gonna ruin you. But gastronomy, excellent. Wine, amazing. There's hot springs, there's hiking. It's just really cool. It's kind of hard to get to because you can't really fly in, but you can fly into Bilbao, take a bus, fly into Madrid, take a bus, fly into um, Pamplona, I guess. Maybe you can fly into Pamplona or Barcelona, take a train. I mean, I guess you could fly into Santiago de Compostela too and take a train too. But overall, my experience being a black woman was fine. Nobody like pointed at me and said, negra, negra. And the reason why I say that is because I wanted to talk to you about my experience in Barcelona. But yeah, I didn't have anyone point at me. No one thought it was weird. No one was like, what are you doing here? Outside of me being like American, they're like, what are you, what are you doing here? And the fact that, you know, I went to law school. So like, you're a lawyer, why? Why are you here? And I'm like, <laughs> everyone wants to know that. My friends and family want to know that. Yeah, <laughs> it was one of those things. But I, I didn't have any issues. I didn't have any issues renting an apartment, but I also bonded with my my landlords. The husband was a lawyer, so we bonded. He's, he took me to his law office, actually. That was cool. Anyway, so I decided to leave La Rioja, one, because I think it's an excellent place if you want to move to Spain and you have a family. I think it's probably a very excellent place to do so because the cost of living is very low comparatively. I'm not sure now with inflation, but it's an excellent kind of way of life. Very quiet, really chill, really family oriented. I mean, the whole country is, but like it's very cozy and uh, there's lots of, you know, family things to do. But at the time, you know, I was a single gal. I mean, I had a, a partner, but you know, I decided to move to Barcelona to be with him. And you know, there just wasn't enough like cultural events. Like, they do have cultural events, they have museums, stuff like that. But I like, I wanted to be around like more ethnicities. I wanted some more spices available to me for my food, just things like that. And I didn't want to be a language assistant, a teacher anymore. And I didn't have to because I got a writing gig. So I then moved to Barcelona. All right, so I, I moved to Barcelona and I've lived in Barcelona for about three and a half years. And okay, this is the thing. Barcelona has gone viral a couple of times in like black, publications, black TikTokers recently about like racism and it's horrible and no one go to Barcelona and things like that. 
And the interesting thing is that I've actually talked to you in the last one that just went viral. Shout out to Monica, who's still in Barcelona. My friend sent it to me. She was like, what do you think about this? She's a black woman, lives in Barcelona, married to a Catalan man. She's from Philly, <laughs> you know, straight Philly. And the TikTok was of someone who had traveled to Barcelona and she said, and this is a paraphrase, so don't come at me if I get it wrong. But she basically said that she people were very racist towards her. They pointed at her, said that, you know, they would call her negra, negra. She didn't feel welcome and things like that. And I am not going to undermine her experience or invalidate her experience. That is hers alone. I'm going to, however, tell you about my experience, okay? And what I find interesting is, is that there's a lot of reasons not to like Barcelona if you actually live there. As a tourist, it's fun because it's totally catered for tourists. Like, in an, an appalling sense, actually, it's completely catered to tourists. And you wouldn't know that unless you live there and you're like, wait, what about us? Yeah, no, they don't care. <laughs> okay. Living in Barcelona, there's plenty of reasons not to like it. One, the crime is insane. And a lot of people, which I think is so interesting, no one really talks about it or in these kind of viral things. The crime is insane. The crime in Barcelona though, in the past had just been professional pickpocketing rings. And when I say professional, meaning like they are professional. You don't even know you're robbed. You don't know where, where you were robbed. Like you would just, all your stuff is gone. Right. And then you have like the other kind of people who do like the scam con artist kind of tricks. Like they put bird poop on you. Well, they have kids involved, newspaper trick and they steal your phone, all that type of stuff. Right. And then you have what has been on the rise, which has been violent crime. Yeah, Barcelona has become Gotham, in my opinion. It's grimy and it's not, again, in a way that most tourists can actually pick up on. Because most tourists are not going to be anywhere that is like, I don't know, seedy. I mean, I don't even think most tourists would be able to pick up on what would be a not nice neighborhood in Barcelona because y'all not over there. The thing is, is that the crime comes to the, to the tourists. So it's like, so it's in all the picturesque alleyways that you see on Instagram, right? Of Barcelona. Yeah. And even in like, you know, in front of cathedrals, like that's where the crime happens. For example, if there's a really popular neighborhood, a lot of Instagrammers go and get shoot their photo shoots there. It's called El Born and it's very nice. I mean, it's very pretty, but I mean, you wanna get robbed somewhere, you go over there. <laughs> you gotta be like on your P's and Q's. I've, I used to live very close to El Born. I used to live in Arc de Triomphe. And uh, I would work at a really cute little cafe in, in Elborn. And I would be sitting at the, at the window, typing, typing. And I'd see a blur of something and I'd turn my head. And then all of here, I hear like, you know, like drone or whatever, like someone running after them and someone else and the police. Like that is the vibe, okay? I need to tell you that because that kind of goes into my experience of living in Barcelona and why I decided to leave. So there's plenty of reasons not to like Barcelona. Crime is one, it's getting more violent. Just the other week, I saw a TikTok or a reel of this guy getting robbed in broad daylight, not even just in broad daylight, in the street. And it's a major street, it's Via Latana. So it's between El Borde and El Gotico, this big ass street. He would get robbed. Like they were, he was getting tussled for his watch off his wrist. It's insane. They took the video, didn't help him. Yeah. So that's also like, you know, that has a lot of things have been happening and there's a lot of, you know, CD activity that happens in Barcelona, like any major city. As a black woman in Barcelona, this is something that I have interviewed several black women who live in Barcelona. So if you have not listen to the podcast, I, I highly suggest you do so. I have Miss Gwen, who is a retired woman. She is 76, I think because her birthday was a couple, like two weeks ago, maybe it was last week. She lives in Barcelona. She gives you her opinion of being a retiree. Her experience is 
different she's like the life of the party and everybody loves her so she has a completely different experience and then i have a, a episode with chloe who is a black british woman of guyanese and jamaican heritage living in barcelona and she gives you her experience in living in barcelona and then i did have miss dr rachel brown who now lives in ghana she moved from spain to, to ghana and she is a Jamaican woman and she gave her experience on, on living in Barcelona. So if you're curious, listen to these stories, okay? My experience as a black woman in Barcelona, I think is really, it's it, the foundation of it is passport privilege. And let's just be 100% real, which is why some of these tourist takes on it is very interesting to me. I'm not doubting their experience, because the thing about it is that they speak so much English in Barcelona. Someone yelling negra at you when you're clearly a tourist and you don't speak Spanish is interesting. It could happen. But also most Spanish, I feel like a lot of Spanish people feel weird saying negra. I think a lot of black people, Afro-Spanish people just say negra. Like black, it doesn't mean nigger, it means black anyway. And I think I get called morena a lot more than negra. And I'm like, eh, I'm negra, no pasa nada, I'm like, okay. So that's also interesting. People's attitudes change immediately when they know that you're American, especially if you're a tourist, you're just in the tourist spots. I, I know that a lot of people think of themselves as travelers, so they go to where they think the locals are. But in Barcelona, you're probably just in where other tourists are. <laughs> just to be honest, like you're probably not, you probably haven't figured out where are like the local spots unless somebody has taken you there. Just saying. Like if it's on a blog, then no, that, that's just tourists <laughs> also. So my experience being a black woman in Barcelona was hmm, interesting. Interesting, I mean, I got cat called, which I mean, you know, it's life, I guess, living in a big city. I got propositioned as a prostitute in Barcelona. I also got propositioned as a prostitute in Logroño, but not when I lived there. When I was walking the Camino Santiago and I had like, I was totally REI'd out and I had like, <laughs> like my like hiking pants in a backpack. And I was like, no. No, so there's that. And yeah, I, I definitely felt that because it's such an international city, that people were very curious, but they, no one was ever like, what do you, like, what, like, why, you, you shouldn't be here. Now I do have a story actually that spurred me creating this podcast where an Australian white dude, I was at a startup event because if you guys know, um, I used to work in startups and i was trying to get a lay of the land and see like what's going on what's cool what's happening and i was at a startup event and this white australian guy was like what are you doing here and i was like oh i'm just here at the startup event you know whatever he's like yeah but what are you doing in spain in barcelona i'm like living you know and it was interesting because the way he said it was like very accusatory i was like what are you doing here it's like equally hard for both of us to immigrate to Spain because you're outside the EU and so am I. So, but I, that has only happened once and that also spurred me creating the podcast. So I guess it was all in God's plan. I would also say dating as a black woman. Now, this is also something that's really featured in the episodes of the podcast because if y'all don't know, I feel like I've said this many times, but I was partnered in Barcelona. I met my partner actually a couple months before I even moved to Spain and on layover in Barcelona. And after that, like that was that. We were together forever. <laughs> Not forever. <laughs> For a while. And so my experience dating is limited. But I think that as a black woman in Spain, in Barcelona, in a bigger city, is like it is you're you're exotic it's something that chloe talks about and she hates it and in her episode she was like i'm not a fruit and look i've also interviewed women who were like lean into it because you know i feel like i had someone who's from chicago new york and she was like i've grown up with girls always calling themselves foreign who are i don't know 
<laughs> like Dominican or whatever, or wherever they're from. She's like, we need to lean to being foreign and exotic. I'm, I'm gonna be honest, I'm still grappling with it. Let me just be clear, like, you know, cause like, something I'm actually exploring, I think I told you guys, I'm writing a book, Four Flourish the Foreign, it's a guide to living well abroad, a guide for black women living well abroad. Not only a compilation of all my episodes and all those kind of insights, but everything I've learned and all the other people I've talked to, cause I've actually have talked to and interviewed a lot more people that are even featured on the podcast. But it is something I'm discussing in the book and I'm really grappling with it because who am I to say what is good for you and what is authentic to you and what you're comfortable with? My discomfort is obviously rooted in, you know, my American baggage. <laughs> like, I'm like, I don't know about this. But I definitely felt exoticized. I was definitely like stared at, but let me be real. You know, I, I am black. <laughs> unambiguously <laughs> and I have copper locks which they like to call rastas which I'm like don't do that and so I stick out wherever I go everywhere I go I stick out and people stare at me and people say you know guapa and nice things or just stare at me I'm like wow so my experience living in Barcelona has that involved making friends? I actually found that to be super easy, making friends. And there's a huge black community in Barcelona. Now this is the thing. If you're online, you will see like on Facebook groups, the Madrid community of black people is way more like vibrant and they do stuff together and they publicize it. They have Melon in Madrid, right? I was actually just in Madrid this past weekend. And I met up with some people and it was fun. And so they always have events and things like that. And so it is like a community. Barcelona had something similar, but it was actually headed up by Rachel Brown, who now moved to Ghana. And she was like really the like leader of it. She was one like, hey guys, we're doing this for Black History Month. Hey guys, we're having mystery dinner like mystery dinner, was it mystery dinner, mystery theater, whatever, like a clue game. And we're all like, what? And we're like, she's like, get dressed. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know. So, you know, having events like that, even during lockdown, we had like online events, but she really was like the leader of it. So I think it kind of fell to the wayside, but there are plenty of black people from all around the world um, living in Barcelona, just living married to Catalans, not married, studying PhDs, being a professor, singers, other types of students, people just kicking it, models, actors, like plenty of people just living in Barcelona. So there is a community, but you do have to tap in and yeah, tap in. And there's a WhatsApp group actually for black women in Barcelona. So there's that. Making friends outside of the black community wasn't difficult at all as well, because I don't know, now this is just my luck. I just would go to events and people would just be like, yeah, you, yes. Because <laughs> I'm an introvert. So I'm like, I'm just, I'm totally comfortable just sitting back in the cut, just like kicking it, like whatever. Um, I made a lot of friends who are Eastern European women, which is so interesting because I actually feel like we like align on a lot of different things, which is very interesting. Kind of like some like values, especially when it comes to dating, like we're very similar um, and very ambitious, like entrepreneurial women. So that was cool. Okay, so why did I decide to leave Barcelona? I decided to leave Barcelona for a lot of reasons. I, I was under lockdown in Barcelona and that was really intense. The cost of living in Barcelona is also so stupid that you'd be like, I live in Spain though, okay? If you guys watched my last IG live, I told you I had an apartment in Logroño in La Rioja, three bedroom, two bath, tall ceilings, exposed brick, wood floors, it had a like primary master bedroom with a bathroom inside and a bathtub because let me tell you in spanish like homes especially newer ones or they remodel it they like to take out the bathtub and they don't they don't like to put it back in and i'm just like no i'm gonna need a bathtub so they had that and i had a balcony in the front of the house and i also had a balcony a really long balcony in the back 
and it had like a covered covering. And it was right in the city center, right next to the old town. So from everything that's popping, got it. That apartment was 520 euro in 2017, right? Three bedroom, two bath, and I rented out the other rooms and it was great, <laughs> I didn't pay anything. Now in Barcelona, my last apartment was a one bedroom, one bath. It was a third floor walk up, so no elevator. And you know, in Spain, third floor is really the fourth floor because the first, like the ground floor is zero. And then you start counting, okay? And, but I lived in my favorite neighborhood, Poblenau, which is right next to the sea. And I actually had a very skinny, like between two things, if you like squint your eyes, I could see the sea from my balcony. So I was very close. I was like maybe a five minute walk if there was traffic crossing the street to the beach. And that apartment was 1,000 euros. Now you're saying like, that's not bad. Actually, no, it's not bad. That was actually a steal because when I got that apartment, it was actually at the height of the market at the time because I got that apartment literally the last week of February, 2020, okay? After, when we, got, when we went into lockdown two weeks later, all the prices just crashed. And all these Airbnbs that had never, you know, there was never any apartments on, on a Idealista or, or whatever, all came, they're all furnished and beautiful and it was so cheap and it was just like, really? I thought it was nice, it was, it was cute, but it, it, you know, it was older and you know, there's that. So one of the reasons was that like the apartment that I really, really wanted was never, never available because it always got snapped up and I would view it it's another conversation. But that's like around 1,400 euro. And again, you might be like, Christine, that is not bad whatsoever. And okay, no, not compared to maybe like Atlanta, obviously New York, Chicago, but for Spain, okay, for Spain. And when you think about the cost of living and like the average salary, you realize that obviously these are being catered to foreigners, which, you know, AIDS and gentrification, a lot of the locals get pushed out. And so, you know, you may have conflict of feelings that way. People always want to be like, you know, I live here. I talk to locals. Like, no, you don't. You talk to, you know, an American, a Dutch, a German, and you know what I mean? And hey, living in an international city, city is like that. But I think also it's problematic when the city, one, allows so much tourist apartments so that the prices go up. They allow so much rent increases that it just becomes inhabitable for locals because then there does become aggression towards foreigners and you'll see that if you're in gracia or other neighborhoods a lot of graffiti where they'll be like you know tourists afuera we hate you die i'm not joking like they say this and they'll put it in english sometimes so everybody can read it so there you go so there's that also, it's a combination of things. I am Southern, I'm from Atlanta, and I like hospitality. And like, I'm a person that when I walk into anywhere, I'm gonna smile, say good morning. I might do a little chit chat, cause that's how we do in the South. Before we get on with the business, we that's just like polite manners. And I think it's a combination of one, Barcelona just being overrun with tourists, so people are like very over it. They're like, no, I'm not gonna, what do you want? And I think also the Catalan culture is quite insular and I perceive it as cold. And I don't like that. Like we don't gotta be best friends. Like saying good morning doesn't mean like I know you and I'm coming over to your house. It just is nice and pleasant. You know, holding doors for people and stuff like that. At first I did take it personally because I'm from the South. I'm like, so what's really white people don't like black people? So you can't say good morning? But no, it actually is for everyone. <laughs> everyone gets that energy. It's something that, you know, my friends who are Eastern European would talk about. They're just like, why so rude? Like everybody was be talking about it. So for me, that was just like for sustainability, right? I'm always talking about living a life well lived. What does that mean? I had to be true to myself. I needed to be okay with changing my mind. I had to be okay with assessing a new situation and being like, what do I actually want? What is, what is it that's working for me? Like I say all the time, it's not about being abroad just to be like, I live in Barcelona. It's about living a life well lived. And so it's my responsibility to take an account of my life, the things that I want, and to try to move in a direction that's truly in alignment with it. 
And as silly as it might sound, like I need people to say good morning to me. <laughs> like I need people to smile at me and I need to be in a culture that is much more warm and, and nice. And I wanna be around people who are not gonna switch to English when they hear my janky Spanish accent. Cause look, I be speaking Spanish. They be like, oh, your Spanish is pretty good. I'm like, yeah, people just let me speak my Spanish with this janky accent. <laughs> yeah, I know what I'm talking about. So that was a reason for, for moving from Barcelona to Valencia. I also left Barcelona, again, like I said, it's really catered to tourists. And it just, it's a hard city to feel rooted in, in my opinion. The energy is also quite frenetic. And like, that's the only word I can use because it just feels like it's always like this. And I'm like, I need to take a deep breath. Even though I really love the beaches and I just love being outside of Barcelona, like hiking, it has all the, it has all the things I really like, like the mountains and the sea, it's like totally my jam. But the city itself is just, for me, it's just too frenetic, right? It's kind of, it's kind of busy and bustling, but like for what? I don't know if that makes sense. Like I get why like New York is like bustling, like, oh, things are happening. But I'd be like, why else? Why are you in a rush? Like, I don't, like, I know you guys have something to do, but it, I don't know. It just was like, it just feels like the energy is very tense for, for me. And honestly, you know, I really needed to get out for my mental health. I just needed to make a move that was just, best for me so i decided to move to valencia where i currently reside and i have been here before i actually studied abroad here 15 years ago every time i say that i'm like that's not true and yes it is and i knew i loved the city before and i actually considered moving to valencia after la rioja and not going to barcelona which probably i should have done Hindsight 2020, we move on. But I decided to move here because one, it's the third largest city in Spain. I was never gonna move to Madrid because Madrid doesn't have any, doesn't have a seat and I need some water, okay? And Madrid is extremely congested and, and dense in population. And Madrid has lots of hills. And I'm not like that. Like Barcelona has hills as you're going towards, you know, Tibidabo and Casarola National Park. But like where I lived was flat, <laughs> you know, like it basically is like from the sea, it starts going on an incline, like very subtly. Basically when you get to, if you guys know the neighborhood Gracia, like it's on a hill, it's going towards there. So like, yeah, it's a hill, but it's not, it's not Madrid. How I feel in Madrid, and I was just there this weekend, it's like everywhere we wanted to go was uphill. And I was like, how is that even possible? That doesn't even make any sense. Everything was up a hill. I was just like, I can't be bothered. <laughs> so that's an honest assessment. And it's too congested, even though it has like all the boutiques and you know, great flights and stuff like that. No, Madrid was never an option. Valencia though is the third largest city in Spain, is on the sea beautiful comunidad full of you know great agriculture obviously known for its valencia oranges and things like that but so much more and i needed somewhere that had like an international airport and was well connected even though being realistic if i am flying stateside i'm probably going to take the train to madrid or barcelona because it's probably going to be like way cheaper just to take a train up there and then fly out but who knows I might monitor the situation, but probably that's what I'll do. And, you know, it has a lot of cultural events. There's a lot of black people here. A lot of like Valenciano, like black Valencianos, which is really cool. Actually, the guy who came to install my Wi-Fi, like he was, I buzzed him in and I was waiting for him out, out, outside my door. And he came up, we both looked at each other. And I was like, hey, he was a black guy. I was like, hey, he was like, hi. I was like, oh my gosh, they don't hear it. It's like, you know, like, where are you from? He's like, Valencia. He's like, how about you? And I was like, oh, I'm clearly not from Valencia. So like, yeah, there, there's black people here, a huge community. I wouldn't say so. I think I still need to get plugged in. The thing is, is that I have a bit of a crutch because I already knew people here. So like, I kind of just hang out with my friends 
and that kind of thing. But there are black people and hopefully I will plug in to like maybe some brunches or some things like that. But I think they alternate between Valencia and Alicante, like Ali Valencia the city and Alicante. So there's that. I also moved here because the cost of living is just incredibly cheaper than Barcelona. Now this inflation is really annoying because even in Barcelona, even La Rioja, like groceries, and I'm a vegan, you guys don't know, so I eat, I eat plants, you know, and in the States, plants, regardless if they're organic or not, are so expensive. I'm like, that's why people don't be eating vegetables, because like, why are mushrooms like $10? Like, are you joking? Especially like, I've lived in La Rioja where a lot of excellent, like different varieties of mushrooms are cultivated, and it's like, I don't even understand this life where like produce is so astronomically expensive. But now with inflation, like my grocery bill's going up. It's still nothing like it in the States. I'm just salty. Cause I'm like, I used to get like all my little fruits and stuff like that for, I don't know, 10 euro. But now I actually order from an organic farm, like co-op by this like, I don't know if they're married, husband and wife partners. They deliver. That's nice too. There's a lot of variety, a lot of local goods and stuff like that. That's also part of why I like living in Valencia. I feel like it's way more community oriented. Like I feel like I know people, you know, like I go to the market. There's always a market usually in every barrio and I go to this big one right next to my house. I have like my favorite stand. You know, I say good morning to her and she's like, oh, what do you need? She always knows I like to get my herbs there. I'm also trying to cultivate my own fresh herbs, so yeah. And so we talk about that and we, you know, she's like, what do you need? What do you want? I have this that you like, you know? It's actually a very great stand because it has like fresh turmeric, ginger, like peppers, like scotch bonnet, all mushrooms. Like I think it's like the best stand in there, but that's neither here nor there. But anyway, like I feel very warm, right? I talk to the girl at the gym. I always say good morning to her, what's up? Girl Pilates, all of them are like, oh, hey, Christine. And I'm like, great. Like, that's important to me. Also, it feels way safer. But also, I think you have to have sense. You know, there's a region, a space here in Valencia. It's a greenway. It's a dried riverbed called the Rio or Turia. And like, people get robbed there, but like, not aggressively. Like, mostly, like, they're like laying and their bag gets snatched. I don't do that. <laughs> Whenever I'm there, I'm like power walking. So there's that and I don't do it super late at night, but I actually have been out there like at 1130 doing my power walk. So for me, Valencia just has a calmer energy and it's just really in alignment with my personal values at this point in my life. I really do like Barcelona, mostly because I'm just super familiar with it. And like my therapist is in Barcelona, my esthetician is in Barcelona. My favorite wax girl is in Barcelona. My friends and like, you know, my favorite vegan gelato place and all the things that like I, I like a lot <laughs> in Barcelona. But I had to make a decision and I just wanted to reiterate that and really talk about it because you can go abroad and change your mind. And in fact, I really want you to always think deeply about what you want. And I think I don't want you ever to be abroad just to be abroad. Like, will you have bad days? Yeah, we have days where you're just like, I gotta take out my trash. That's me today. Because I used to live in Miami where I had like a trash valet and I was like, that was, that was a good life. But you know, like you have adulting things and stuff like that, but overall, are you living a life well lived? Are, is this place conducive to you cultivating, right? Because it doesn't just happen. You do have to work for it. Is it conducive to that? And for me, living in Valencia, it's very conducive for that. And I think the proof has been in the pudding for me mentally, emotionally, and just how I'm kind of moving and grooving my life right now. 
Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this episode of Flourish in the Foreign. And if you are, be sure to support this podcast by going to buymeacoffee.com slash flourish foreign and buying me a coffee. You can also write a review of the podcast on Apple Podcast, Podchaser, and anywhere else you listen to the show. Thank you so much for listening and supporting. Now, back to the episode. And it's important that you're true to yourself, right? We don't go abroad for IG. You don't have to go abroad and become a content creator. That's a whole different conversation. <laughs> That's no shade to nobody. It's no shade to nobody. But you don't have to go abroad and become a content creator. You don't have to go abroad and tell people and show people everything you do every day, all day. I don't. My friends be like, do you even live in Spain? Not my friends. My friends and I live in Spain. But like people who just follow me on my personal page. Like, do you still live in Spain? I'm like, yeah, because I'm living. Right? I'm not showcasing. I'm living. I'm living here. So it's important that you do it for yourself. It's important that in every moment, you're making that assessment of, am I taking the steps that I need to take that are gonna cultivate my wellness and being honest with yourself and being true to yourself. Give yourself the space to change your mind. You don't gotta explain it to anybody. You don't gotta explain it to anyone. I don't explain shit to anyone. <laughs> you don't have to do that, right? It's about your life. It's your life and moving abroad is already a freaking hassle. So if it's not working out, if it's not what you want, if it's not quite right, please, please trust yourself, believe in yourself, bet on yourself to make a move. Regardless if it's a, if it's a different country, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't. So for a lot of people who think about moving abroad, like for the first time, they're like, if I move abroad, it has to be right. But what you'll find is that once you move abroad, You'd be like, moving abroad and moving somewhere else is a hassle because moving is a hassle regardless of where you are. But like, you'd be like, I could do it. I was just talking to someone about it. I was like, they're like, are you gonna stay in Spain? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I really wanna visit Rwanda. I really wanna visit New Zealand. And I was just like, you know, if I feel it, I'll move to New Zealand. And they're like, really? And I'm like, yeah, because I moved to Spain. <laughs> like, I can move abroad. Like, it's, I know like, generally the steps to, it takes to, to move and what to expect and all these other things. So I just want you to just trust yourself, believe in yourself, and also stop putting so much pressure on yourself to get it right. Because uh, oftentimes when we're first making that first leap, right, we're basically comparing what we are doing now, our life now. And that might be a little bit of escapism and it might be a little bit of romanticism. And so it, it really, affects your choices. And once you're abroad, you'll be like, actually, it's this. Actually, that's like, this is fine, but like well-being, thriving, all those things, this is something different, right? Not just, oh, I can breathe, but actually to flourish, to thrive, to be and to have and to live a life well-lived may be different. And I want to give you, I want you guys to give yourself that grace to change your mind and do what's best for you. Okay. The question is from Anna and Riqueta. Could we meet? Oh, I don't really meet people. I will be in Valencia in August. Would love to meet. I'm Anna traveling solo. Anna, I may or may not be here in Valencia in August. Sure. I mean, I'm sure if I'm here, we could probably get a coffee. I kind of feel bad because people ask me this all the time, <laughs> actually, and usually I'm not in town. <laughs> so when I was in Barcelona, I, I think I got like maybe 10 to 15 people asking me like, can we hang out? And I'm like, one, y'all, I'm an introvert. Okay, <laughs> so there's that. But two, I would always be out of town. And I don't think people believe me. I think people just thought like I was avoiding you. And no, because if I didn't really want to, I'd be like, no. But okay, so if I'm in town, okay, hit me up. Okay, same answer every time living. Yeah, you know, I think you're referring to when I said, when people ask me like, what are you doing in Spain? You know, I feel like some people, it's always about like the tone of how people ask you. I feel like old people, <laughs> older people, 
are like, what are you? Because they always think I'm a student. So they're like, one, because I'm baby faced, but also because I like wear kids. So they're like, you're a student, aren't you? And I'm like, I'm not. I'm a grown adult wearing kids. That's another conversation. But for other people who are more accusatory, like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, living and minding my black ass business. How about that? <laughs> they don't like that. They don't, they don't, you know, they don't like that. Okay. Okay. What's your skincare routine? You are glowing. Thank you very much. <laughs> This is also, how about this? My skin has never been better. Living in Spain, I think, really has helped. Being out of a toxic relationship helps as well. Drinking lots of water. And what else do I do? Oh, I drink chlorophyll water. And I take little vegan collagen. And I just use, like, you know, regular, ordinary products and things like that. And I, I exercise. But I don't, I'm not a skincare girl, so. And I use SPF. That's about it. The international life is working. Girl, I, I be working. I'm grateful, but it's a lot. Where to next? Mm, this year? I don't know, maybe. But that's kind of the cool thing about being living in Spain, being a single woman. I can go to Menorca tomorrow, like dead ass. I could just go to Menorca. <laughs> and it's like, okay. So who knows? I might go to, well, I'm probably gonna go to Menorca tomorrow, but like I could, so we'll see. Jewel of the Nile 7, how do you find a place that aligns with your values? Oh yeah, this is like my favorite thing to talk about. How do you find a place? I'm assuming that you're saying finding like a country or maybe even a city or community. This is what I always tell people to do. I used to have a guide that's free, but actually now it's getting launched and now it's a pink guide, so there's that. But I've talked about it so many times. So what you want to do before you decide on a place. I actually tell people don't decide on a place because for me, we're talking about wellness. And sometimes the place that you love on vacation is not the place that's conducive for your wellness. It just isn't. It's just a cool place to like visit, right? Like, yeah, you love the Maldives, but maybe you don't wanna live there for a variety of reasons. Like Barcelona is dope to visit, but would you live there? Miami is fun on the weekends. I've lived there and I'm like, no, <laughs> right? So I, I want you to put that to the side. Just put it to the side for a moment. And what I want you to do is I want you to consider these main points of your life, your professional wellness, your financial wellness, your emotional wellness, or social wellness, your mental wellness, your physical wellness, and if so, your spiritual wellness. And I want you to consider what things in your life are working out for you, right? What things you're like, this is 100% in alignment with who I am and what I want in my life. It's important for you to write that out because those are the things that you're gonna want to maintain or somehow replicate when you go abroad. So those are gonna be things that are going to be kind of like your guiding star. Right. So that's important. What things are working out. And then from that list of things are working out, it's important to see which things are kind of you know, atmospheric, environmental, because that will also kind of give you an inclination and a direction for places in, in countries that will be in alignment with it. Because a lot of times we get the vibes and energy, but we need to articulate. We need to write down what it is that we're looking for so that we can actually put it out into the Google or to the universe, or you have someone help you to articulate what is it that actually you need, you like about your current situation, what you're looking for, right? From the things that are not environmental and external, the things that are just internal, like just you being awesome and amazing, it's important to acknowledge that because like I said before, earlier in this live, you are gonna go through a period of self-doubt, homesickness, isolation, what have you. And it's important for you to always know that like no matter what, like I'm that girl because of X, Y, and Z. Like no matter where I am in the world, like I do this and I'm gonna be great, right? On the other hand, it's important for you to make a list of things that are not working out and have no judgment about it and don't hold back. What I find is that a lot of people lie to themselves and like, you don't need to, this is your piece of paper. But this is the thing, if we don't take the time to be honest and to go deep in this moment, you are going to play yourself 100%, right? 
hundred percent. You're going to play yourself. Like you just are. So it's important for you to be honest about what is not working out for you in your life, professionally, financially, emotionally, mentally, right? Get really specific, pour it out. Again, you don't got to tell me, you want to tell nobody else. And then from all those things, when you write out, I want you to think about and categorize those things. What things are environmental, right? The, the situation, whether it be people or the place and the infrastructure that is just not working out for you. And that should be a clue for the things that you will not settle for when you go abroad, right? That's why I say don't think about a country or a place because too often people will try to shoehorn their life and their dreams into a place. And I'm like, no, we're going for wellness. Who says you can't travel? Just because you live abroad don't mean you can't travel and go to this place, right? But it doesn't mean you should live there. So you want to take that list of the things that don't work out, how much of it is, is environmental, and how much of it is me. And this is key, because no matter where you go, there you are. You bring yourself. You know, if you've been in some of these Facebook groups, I'm not going to talk about them, not today, but they be trying to get people in jail. And I'm like, I have to scroll away. I got to scroll away. A lot of bad advice, a lot of toxicity. You go into these, you know, Facebook groups, you'll hear people who be like, why do you live here? Why do you live there? I hate this. Da, 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 da. And the thing is, is like, no matter where they go, they're going to have a shitty time or it's not going to be what they want because you know what? They're bringing themselves. That's the thing. It's like, sorry, boo. Like it's you. It's not Colombia. It's not Senegal. It's not Australia. It's you. It's you. You are the problem. And hey, Everybody has to have that coming to Jesus moment. How about that? I had that moment in La Rioja. I was burnt out in Atlanta. I moved to La Rioja, wine region. I'm working 12 hours a week, three days a week, uh, having these lushy lunches that turn to dinner, just drinking wine, just drinking it. Having a great time, but my burnout wasn't solved. My happiness hadn't been rejuvenated. Like. I had to recognize that I had really subscribed to a certain type of lifestyle, a certain type of work culture, that my identity was very much rooted in what I did and what I did not do, how I felt about it. Was I going to feel worthless or was I going to do something about it? Like I had to have that conversation with myself. I had to resolve that with myself. I could not expect a place to heal me. I couldn't expect an experience to heal me. Now, a place and an experience can create the space for healing. But as y'all know, if you listen to a podcast, it's all about cultivation, which means that we have to get interested and get our hands dirty in the cultivation of our life. We have to plant the seeds of the harvest we would like to reap. Right. So it's imperative that you're honest with yourself, the things that work and the things that don't work. You just have to. If you are not honest with yourself, it's not going to work out. You're going to play yourself 100%. Once you've done that kind of assessment, then you have kind of, you know, this, this knowledge of this is what I really desire and require from this vantage point of my life. And this is the stuff that I just can't have. I can't settle for. And this is the stuff that I need to, I need to take ownership of. Like, this is my baggage. I need to go see a therapist. I need to resolve this. I need to create these boundaries now or at least be aware of this is going to contribute to my experience abroad. And then something a little bit different that I always tell people is like, you know, when we talk about wellness, a lot of people like to go like, mm, to my highest and best self, which, you know, I think is very great and aspirational. My highest and best self would not curse, would not, you know, I don't know, shoulder check people who like walk too close to me on the sidewalk things like that not there yet so you know and i would meditate for an hour and things like that that's my highest and best self am i moving that direction yes am i her no i'm not pressed about it what i always tell people is like i want you to think about your favorite version of yourself your favorite version of yourself which should feel like indulgent like really yummy, like think about the things that you're doing when you're in like your favorite version of yourself, right? It doesn't feel aspirational. It feels comfortable. It feels warm. It feels familiar and yum, like, right? It feels yum, like cake or whatever you think is yum, like mango. Like it feels like, yeah, 
I love that. So for example, one of my like favorite versions of myself is honestly, you know, when I'm putting on like events, I used to put on an event in Atlanta called Pecha Kucha. I really like putting on community events that have the required deep thinking and create spaces for deep contemplation. I also like having, you know, dinner parties and I haven't had one in a while, but it's really one of my favorite things to do, to be a hostess, to pour people drinks, be like, no, 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 and pour some more and have people, you know, fat and happy and, you know, a little bit tipsy and, you know, boisterous conversation and laughter. Like these are me and my elements, right? Having these kind of intimate moments. That's part of me being my favorite version of myself. And so you might say, like, how does that help me pick a country? Well, I have to say that when you start contemplating on your favorite version of yourself, you start seeing images and situations that you want to be a part of. So write those things down, right? I live in a country that has like three to four wine regions. So I'm all, I always, I mean, no matter where I live in the world, I always have a wine guy. I don't know how that's possible because I really don't drink that much wine, I think, but whatever. Like I live in a country where like wine, no problem. A country, the culture of socialization, of warmth and intimacy is already locked in. Like, yes, a country, you know, that has that kind of space for these cultural events and things like that. I live in a city that is actually quite international with still a lot of local people, a lot of Valencianos who have lived abroad and are international, a lot of expats and digital nomads. So having the type of events that I'd like to have is like no problem. I actually just had one earlier this week. And so that's what I'm talking about, right? When I'm thinking about my life, I'm thinking about cost of living, right? I'm thinking about like, temperature. I'm thinking about access to travel and things like that. I'm thinking about maybe if it's important to dating and friends. I'm thinking about clothes, thinking things that fit me. I'm also thinking about like, how do I feel? How do I feel? Which is so important. It's so important that when you're casting that vision that you're tapped into how you feel. It's also important that when you cast that vision, it's not being cast from a space of escapism or romanticism because then you have relief, which is great. But really, when you think about it, when you move from escapism and romanticism, it's just about anywhere being better than here. And that's not necessarily conducive for longevity or sustainability or cultivating a life well lived. Cultivating a life well lived requires you to be more particular, for you to be more nuanced, for you to be more curious about who you really are now and who you aspire to be. The, the things that you actually maybe have been denying yourself. And I think for a lot of black women, we have denied ourselves, right? That wasn't possible. That's not possible. We, you know, don't ask for too much. Like, that's good enough. We make do. We're very resourceful. You know, black women will come, we're like, okay. You know, we, we make it. Uh, I'm going to work with it. I'm going to work with it and I'm going to excel. I'm going to work with it. But this is a time to really think about what would it be like if I lived a life in which I didn't have to make do? What would it be like if I lived a life of ease? What does ease even mean in my life? For me, ease does it mean not working? I actually like, I like my business. I like creating. I like doing the things that I do and meeting with the people that I meet with. But what is, what I love about living in Spain and what has Spain created for me is a sense of ease and work. Sometimes I tap into it, sometimes I don't. But this is what I mean. It, I don't live in a space or a community where we're trying to one up each other, okay? I have a legal background. That's obvious that that would be the, uh, the case and also entrepreneurial background. So that is the case. And I think also just the toxic kind of grind culture of American culture in general has that one upmanship. Like you should do this or what are, what are you doing? I don't have that here. Okay. Most people are just like, what do you do? That's cool. And like, or, or they don't even really ask what I do. I just be like hanging out. People are like, wait, what? And I'm like, yeah, I do all this stuff. And they're like, I would have never guessed because you wear these kids. <laughs> You just be bebopping around. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do, right? How does that feel? For me, it, it, it also creates a space of ease of I'm able to create a business on my terms at a pace that I want, taking opportunities that I want, creating the things that I want, working with the people that I want. 
having really cool opportunities that I want that wouldn't be afforded to me if I didn't live in this country at this time, right? Maybe it could happen in other countries, but that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about ease. Ease is not just like laying up in a hammock. I definitely fall out of every hammock I get into. So that for me is not ease, it's anxiety. Um, but that's what I'm talking about. I want you guys to do this kind of work and then tap into that feeling. Relief, yes. Safety, hell yeah. But more. Because I feel like black women, women of color, especially in the United States, goodness, we're not given the luxury for deep contemplation. We have been on go since we were on birth, right? Our parents have expectations. Society has expectations. You want to be this, you want to be that. You got to go, you got to do it. Gotta go, gotta do it. And we perform and we get all the things and we do all the stuff. I actually want you to take a deep breath and luxuriate and really deeply contemplate. Not for an aim, right? Not for like, I have to figure it out. No, I want you to deeply consider and luxuriate about what does a life well lived look like and feel like to you? How will you know that you're living a life well lived? Oh, I have affordable health care. Go deeper. Because also, what does affordable health care mean? I talk about this all the time. People just be using words. And I'm like, affordable to you doesn't mean affordable to me or vice versa. Like, what do you really mean? What do you really mean? In particular, with what's going on in the United States now, which is not surprising at all. I actually had this whole conversation with my Spanish teacher today. I had a whole hour where I just went on a tirade in Spanish about about American politics, which was very surprising. I didn't know I I could do that, and I did. So there's that. <laughs> but like particularly, people be like, I want good health care, and I want it to be affordable. This is this is a good lesson. What does good health care mean to you? What does good health care mean to you? Don't speak in generalities. Speak to you and your situation. <laughs> That's it, right? Like, you don't even be concerned about like, well, this over, like, talk about you and your situation. What's that you're needing now or in the future? What does good health care mean to you? What are the, the what are the, the pillars of good health care? What does it encompass, encompass? Who are involved? Like, what does that mean to you? Write that down. Because I promise you, good health care, girl, what? What does that mean? Because the thing is, like, America actually has excellent health care, like systems, people working in it. Access to it, no. Affordability, no. Ridiculous, intrusive, human rights violating laws, yes, right? But, like, health care, quality of the health care in, you know, particular sectors can be quite excellent. But if we're speaking specifically to your experience, is it something that you're looking for where you know, black maternity rates, death rates are not high, you know, where they're like, what do you mean? People don't die giving birth. This is, you know, 2022, right? Yeah. Okay. Like be specific to your situation and what you're wanting. That's going to help you, right? That's going to help you to visualize and to feel, drop down into that feeling space about what does a life well lived look like? If I'm looking for healthcare that sees me, acknowledges me, cares for me, heals me, engages in preventative care, all these different things, that feels safe. I feel nurtured. I feel heard. You see what I'm saying? Cool. That's what I would say. That's how I would start the process. When you have all of these things outlined, then you can start asking questions about specific regions or Google searches that will be way more fruitful for you because you will have very specific questions. So you'll get very specific answers. And so the research of like country selection becomes way easier because you know exactly what you're looking for and you know how to discern clearly what you're looking for. You're not going on vibes. And you're not trying to shoehorn your life and what you want into something else, which is I feel like what we've already been doing, trying to fit into something. And it doesn't fit, you know? It's ill-fitting like a burlap sack. And that's not what moving abroad is about. It's about going abroad and cultivating a life well lived. Okay, any other questions? My favorite place in Valencia right now like food or a bar? Hmm. 
what is my favorite place? You know, I really like Toria. It's a it's a dry riverbed. It's this long green space, parks, like soccer fields. That's where they have like the wine festival, the skate park. People do Zumba. Like it's super long. I think it is five, maybe more, five miles long, and it also ventures out into other parks. And it kind of goes towards the port. So it doesn't really connect to like the beach, but you're kind of close when you get over there. Um, that would be my favorite place. I really like being out in nature and yeah, and I get my steps in easily. I listen to my podcast and stuff like that. Thank you so much again for tuning in and supporting. I appreciate you. Please know that I may not know you personally, but I want us all to win. I want us all to feel free. I want us all to be well. That is sincere and true. I really do, which is why I talk the way I do, why I produce a podcast the way I do, why I just do this. It's because I really want you to win. Don't want you just escape. Don't want you just to like, you know, I want you to actually live a life well lived because you deserve it. That's what I want, okay? So remember, it's not about moving abroad, y'all. No, and it for sure isn't about just being abroad for like vibes or IG, no. It's about thriving abroad. So go abroad and cultivate a life well lived. See you guys next time. Have a nice day. Bye. I wanted to come and give you guys a little bit of a, an amendment to this episode because I recorded this live in the summer of 2022 and there has been some changes to two of the cities well, probably all three, but two that I know for sure since the last time I recorded. Both Barcelona and Valencia have had major shakeups in their local governments, which I think is important to always be mindful of when you move abroad. I think sometimes people don't think about politics at all because some people have the misguided notion that national or even regional and local politics will not affect them as expats, which is so misguided. <laughs> it's so misguided. And if you listen to some of the episodes of the podcast, especially earlier, because we were recording during COVID, which was such an interesting time to really look at governmental responses to the pandemic. Uh, I think most of my guests would definitely say that local politics, or at least national politics, does have some bearing and affects their life in some way, whether it be with like immigration policies, tax policies, or something like that. So in Barcelona, the mayor was ousted, I guess. It was actually quite... I don't, I don't know about controversial, but it was, it was an uproar in Barcelona. Two seemingly opposed parties decided to go into coalition to get the mayor out. So there you go. From my understanding, there are two parties that are against independence. So if you guys have listened to me talk about the independence movement in Barcelona, those are the two parties that prevailed and placed a mayor in Barcelona. Here in Valencia, the right-wing party has come into power in coalition with the far-right party. So that's always interesting. Also, you might have heard a couple of weeks ago or months ago about the racist football or soccer incident that happened here in Valencia where a black Brazilian player who plays for Real Madrid was in town playing football and some Valencia supporters were chanting and mocking him and throwing racial abuse at him. And that became an international incident. And why am I bringing all this up? Well, because I think you should know. <laughs> and I think that's important. I did have some people ask me about the situation. And I think it's abhorrent. Obviously, it's it's crazy and ridiculous. It's 2023 as the time of this recording. These things shouldn't be happening. But I will say like Spanish football is very notorious for, for some reason, just going all xenophobic and racist when it comes to like these football matches. I don't, I don't get it. I don't go to football matches and I haven't had anything like that ever happen to me here in Spain. So I want you guys always to be aware of that. 
And of course, yes, the the ruling party here in Valencia is a coalition of the right wing. What does that mean for local living and things like that? We will see. There are some things that are just protected, like nationally protected, like abortion rights, a lot of women's rights and things like that. So we will just keep an eye on what exactly this coalition is looking to do. I definitely know there's a lot of people that I know that are not happy with it, but it's one of those things around the world, people got to vote. So that is my update. And I just want to encourage you all to always keep abreast of political situations, either in the country, region, city that you're looking to move to, or if you're already abroad. It's so, so important. And there's so many resources. I suggest you get your news from multiple sources so that you can really have a clear understanding of politics, economics, and social issues. It's so important to be aware. Okay. You can't depend on, if you're from the United States, the State Department giving you alerts and things like that. They do give you alerts if something that does happen. But, you know, when I was in Barcelona, they would send out these alerts about protests and the protests would have already started. OK, so you want to do your due diligence. Right. And just keep abreast of all the situations. All right. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Flourish in the Foreign. Be sure to become a Buy Me a Coffee member and join me for all of those exclusive benefits so that we can hang out and chat and do all those nice things. And as always, big thanks to Zachary Higgs, who produced the music of this here podcast. Remember, it's not about moving abroad. It's not about being abroad. It's about flourishing abroad. So go abroad and cultivate a life well lived. See you next time.